take your Bibles and open up to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. Our text today will be Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 8, and um, I'll get to it in just a minute. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 8. If you need a little help finding the book of Jeremiah and you have a Bible with you, it's between the two books of Genesis and Revelation. You look between those two books, I promise you'll find it there. Uh, thank you for the great special music today. All the music is always so awesome, and, and that's just a, it makes it fun to come and be a part of uh, what's going on at Ridgeway Baptist Church. Well, the title of the message today is Always Faithful. We're really going to be talking about how the Lord is the one that's always faithful. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, but please don't answer out loud, okay? All right, don't answer out loud. Have you ever been disappointed in someone? Don't answer, okay? Especially while I'm preaching. All right, so, so um, have you ever been disappointed in somebody? Has, ever, has there ever been a time when someone let you down? Has there ever been maybe a famous person or a hero that you looked up to and then you found out something or something happened later and kind of uh, burst the bubble, it uh, killed the illusion or whatever? Well, really the, the end of the sermon today, go ahead and give it to you, is that, that we should be Jesus watchers and not people watchers. You know, if we look at each other. If you look at me, I'll let you down. I'll fail you. If I look at you, you'll let me down. You'll fail me. Um, And that's maybe part of the maturing in the Christian life is we tend to look at someone as the encouragement in the faith rather than just keep our eyes on Jesus. And so so we want to see today how the Lord is the one that's always faithful. Uh, People um, will come and go. Uh, People will fail. Uh, Sometimes they do great things. Sometimes they do bad things. But if you keep your eyes on the Lord, that's really how you and I can stay strong in the faith. Now we're going to start off talking about some of the problems back in the day of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, sometimes called the weeping prophet, he not only wrote the book of Jeremiah, he wrote a whole book called Lamentations, lamenting or woe from all the problems that happened. And he was somebody that really saw kind of the the fulfillment of the promises of judgment. All these prophets had come along and said, you better repent. God's going to bring judgment. You better repent. Time is coming. And people said, you know, we've got more time. There's no point in getting right with God now. Uh, I mean, he'll be merciful. He'll wait. And then finally, when the nation is conquered and the people carried into captivity, that's all during Jeremiah's prophetic ministry. And so he gets to be the, the prophet the religious leader at the time when the judgment finally happened. And so he has a lot of messages for people about how to deal with with the chaos of the day and how to deal with when they're disappointed. And you know, sometimes they don't admit it, but some of them, right or wrong, and they're wrong, but they're actually disappointed with the Lord. It's like, why didn't he give us more time? Why didn't he give us more warning? Why didn't God do this? Sometimes uh, we may not admit it, but we get frustrated, and so we have to submit to the Lord. And so we're going to see a lot of that in our passage today. All right, Jeremiah. 23 verse 1 I'm reading from the New American Standard translation woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture declares the Lord now woe here is not woa like slow down and stop but but it's like you would you would call out or cry if you're in shock about something if you if you have an expression when something happens to you and he says these shepherds who are destroying the sheep of my pasture Now, here he's using a nickname for the religious leaders of the day. It's really really kind of a a group term. Now, who's he talking about? We'll talk about that first and then why use the term shepherd. He's talking about, first of all, the group of people that if anybody were going to be faithful to the Lord, it were going to be the priests. These descendants of Aaron, they were tasked with a job, and that was not only to make sure that that the uh, sacrifices at the tabernacle and later the temple were done rightly according to the Bible, but also to make sure that the people were living a righteous life. They weren't worshiping other gods and false gods and, and false religions and things like that. So the priests were descendants of Aaron, You became a priest because you were born into a priestly family. From a child, you were trained to be a priest. Uh, You never knew anything else but being a priest. And so so that was your not only your calling, not only your job, but really it was your your family. You you followed in the father's footsteps generation after generation. And and the thought was that this uh, kind of keeping a tight control over the priesthood, this will make sure that they stay strong 
for the Lord. So if there's one group we should trust in the Old Testament, it should be the priests. They're all descendants of Aaron. And, um, and so that, that way they should be the trustworthy ones. But they failed. Uh, they're involved with wrong religious practices. Well, okay, well, if the priests let us down, at least we've got the prophets. Now, what is a prophet? There's two kind of words that we don't use a lot in the English language. A prophet has two jobs. He forth tells, he announces the word of God. He'd, he'd be like, and today we might call it like a preacher. And, and the prophets did more preaching, be righteous, don't be sinful, than anything else. But they also foretold what was going on in the future. As the Holy Spirit revealed things to them, they would say, this is what's going to happen someday. So being prophetic was not saying this is going to happen uh, 2,000 years from now, always. But a lot of times those future predictions are really just a part of their message of righteousness. Well, if the priests let us down, at least we've got those prophets. Those prophets, they'll stand strong, these preachers of righteousness. And so, so we can trust them. They all have the responsibility of caring for the souls of the people of Israel and anybody else that wants to come and live in the land of Israel and follow the Lord. Now here they're called shepherds because that's a term that would have been very familiar to them back in the day. Now you may have sheep at home. I don't know. I know that, that a lot of people don't have sheep in their backyard anymore. Okay, If you do, good for you. Um, some people have chickens some people have chickens. That's become more of a normal thing. I was talking with one of our um, uh, part-time professors at Mid-America, Dr. Joseph Shen. And Dr. Shen was telling me, he said, you know, my hearing is not good because when I go outside, it sounds like I hear chickens. And my wife says, you're hearing things. And I asked him where he lived. And I said, you know, okay. So I figured it out. I made a phone call. I said, your backyard is next to the backyard of my son and daughter-in-law who have chickens. He said, aha, would you tell this to my wife? So, so it's, it's a true, it was a true report. All right, so you may have chickens, you probably don't have sheep. Now, I need to be honest with you today. I try to be transparent and preaching as much as possible, but just to be fair to you, I've never been a shepherd. All right, I've never been a, never been a sheep herding shepherd, but I have read about it on the internet, so I'm practically an expert, all right? So, so I mean, if it's on the internet, it's got to be true, right? I mean, what could be wrong with that? So, so um, but yeah, here's what the internet says, or people, or if you're actually looking for the Bible Land source book, which is really where I go to that, and then the second thing, the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, my favorite Bible study resource. Well, anyway, so sheep are stupid. They just do stupid stuff. They tend to go in a group, and when the group goes in the wrong direction, they all go in the wrong direction. Sheep can have problems, like when they roll over on their back and don't know how to get up, and then they die. Uh, sheep are animals that are easy prey. In other words, uh, whenever a wolf is looking for an easy snack and there's some sheep around, I'll start with the sheep. I mean, there, there's a fancy, there's a, there's a Hebrew word for that. It's called uh, appetizer. Um, I don't know if, you, if that translates into English very well. But anyway, so, so, um, so that, that's what sheep are. All right, so, so, and guess what you and I are called in the Bible? Sheep. Spiritually, we tend to wander off the good grass. We tend to wander away from the pasture. We get bored with the care of the shepherd. And so, so we need the shepherd to constantly guide us and correct us. We don't want a shepherd that beats us. We want a shepherd that keeps us in the good pasture and protects us from the harmful things. And so these uh, spiritual leaders in the Old Testament, they're compared to shepherds. All right. So the people need that guidance. And you and I need the guidance as well. And it has, says here, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. This is the Lord speaking. He says, all right, I've got a special announcement for all those shepherds that are, instead of caring for the sheep, growing the sheep, feeding the sheep, tending to the sheep, binding up their wounds, caring for them, flipping them right side up, getting them out of the ditch for those that are actually uh, killing the sheep. He said, woe to you. In other words, judgment is coming. Now, this is a, a good reminder that, that, you know, everybody is going to let somebody down at some point in time. 
Everybody does. I mean, if, if, uh, if, uh, if we could have, uh, you know, a, a dollar for every time somebody says, well, I don't go to church because somebody, and then you fill in the blank, right? I don't go to church because somebody let me down. I mean, we wouldn't have to take up an offering anymore, would we? We just would say, uh, we've got enough. I mean, sometimes somebody will tell you, I don't go to church because there are too many hypocrites in the church. And that's when you can just say, you know, there's always room for one more. Please come this Sunday when Mike preaches. So, so I mean, that's the idea there is that, that uh, you know, if everybody's got an excuse. And so, so, yes, have you been hurt? You have. Has some, maybe a parent or family member done something wrong? Yes, they have. Has maybe even a Bible teacher, Sunday school teacher, a deacon or a pastor, have they, have they hurt you at some time or other? Probably so. If you've been around church enough, you know, I, I have found that a lot of times it's when you're trying to be funny or make a joke or something like that, and maybe what you intended to be funny, somebody took personally, and so it may be an unintentional hurt. You know, sometimes pastors, preachers, teachers, seminary professors make unintentional mistakes. Okay, so have I ever made unintentional mistakes? More than I'll admit to ever. So um, the last time I took a group to Israel, we got off the plane and the tour starts immediately. You get on the bus, they throw your luggage in there. You hadn't even been to the hotel, a little jet laggy. And so we went to the city of Joppa, where of course um, the famous prophet Moses ran away instead of going to Assyria and was swallowed by the whale. Yeah, that's what I said. I know. And everybody's just, everybody's just going amen and laughing. And they're ha- I thought, this is the best sermon I've ever preached. Nobody, and I said it like 20 times. So it's not like I just, you know, I, I, whatever. I've got great excuses. Whenever preachers start with the excuse, they're making excuses, right? So, so um, I got the name wrong. I should know better. I did know better. And I've never lived it down. And, and uh, I still have people that have come up, best trip I've ever wrong. I learned things about the Bible that I've never heard since. So anyway. All right, so sometimes you make an, you make an unintentional intentional error, an unforced error. Okay, so sometimes uh, somebody may be a Bible teacher or a church leader in some way or whatever, and, and they, just, they just do something wrong. Maybe you're having a bad day, and, and, um, and maybe you just got angry, and maybe you were angry at something else, but you took it out on somebody. It was wrong. You shouldn't have done it, um, and so, so you acted wrongly. You were in the flesh in the moment, um, but you did it, and so, so, you know, those are two examples, but in this case, these are people that are deliberately trying to harm the spiritual lives of people. So this is not somebody that says something wrong or somebody that's having a bad day. I mean, this is somebody that is calculating. They're saying, I'm going to, for whatever purposes, I want to get people off track. And God says, you know what? I see that. Now, the thing is, is that whatever category we're in, we know the truth is in the Bible. If you want to know the truth, the truth doesn't come from a person. The truth doesn't come from a source. The truth doesn't come from the internet. The truth comes from the Bible. The only thing you and I can trust is this Bible, the Word of God. It's the only thing that is true. The Bible is all true all the time. Now, somebody tried to ask me a trick question one time. They said, are there any lies in the Bible? Well, the answer to that is actually yes, because Satan's quoted in the Bible when he's lying to Jesus in the temptations, but it truly and accurately reports the lying of the devil. So the Bible is true. And so if you want to know the truth, you first of all have to go to the Bible. If you're looking at anything else, well, this famous preacher said it, so that's good enough for me. That's that's fine to a point. But ultimately, if you want to know the truth and I want to know the truth, we find it in the Word of God. If you're tired of society lying to you or this old world telling you things that aren't true, spend time in the book. The wisdom of the Bible will give you insight into the lies and deceptions of the world. All right, so these are shepherds that are destroying the flock of God. So even in that case, though, the Lord says he has a remedy. Now he goes on in verse 2, therefore, thus says the Lord God. Now, in our Bible here, the, the names of God, are, in, especially in the Old Testament, are always a theme for the passage. So Lord God, in, in our English Bibles, L-O-R-D, all four letters are capitalized. And that's, uh, that's the way that the translators let us know this is Yahweh, or something, the older version is Jehovah, but it's the covenant name of God. 
So when Moses stands there before the uh, burning bush way back earlier in the Bible and God is speaking to him and God says, I want you to go back to Egypt and lead my people out of slavery and I want you to go back and set them free and Moses to the bush says, well, whom shall I say sent me? In other words, what is your name? And the Lord speaks from the bush and says, I am. And it's really a, an interesting thing. That's his name. Our God says, I am. In other words, he is the only true God, the only God. He is eternally existent. Yahweh is kind of connected to that. But, but the way you read it in the Bible is the God who keeps his promises. So whenever you see Lord in all capital letters, and every now and then G-O-D will be in all capital letters, but that means that's Yahweh. And then here, Lord God, that's Yahweh Elohim, the exalted God who always keeps his promises. All right, so thus says the Lord God to Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my pasture, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I'm about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Now, here's what the Lord says. It's kind of interesting because the, the shepherds are, are trying to harm people spiritually. They're doing a bad job of shepherding or caring. The Lord says, hey, for all you false shepherds, I've got some shepherding lessons I'd like to show you. Now, when the Lord says, I'm going to tend to you, you're in my special flock, that's not a good thing. Have you ever been in the special group? You know, um, schools have changed a lot. I went to public school all the way uh, through the end of high school, uh, then went to a Baptist college, but, but, um, but, but we had a number of names for, um, for things, and one of them was called detention, detention. So at McClellan High School, John L. McClellan High School, Little Rock, Arkansas, there were about 1,500 people there in the high school, public high school, and so um, that was just in 10th, 11th, and 12th grades, three grades, so really big school. And so um, one day I came in late to, um, to the, the first period English class, Miss West class, and so um, and I, I didn't have a note. I didn't have a note uh, excusing me. And so she said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to send you to detention. Okay, so at that time, my arrest record was pretty light. So this was a big deal for me. You'll get that later. Sorry. All right, so, so, um, so I've got to go to detention where all the bad people go. And so, so that means that when school is over, um, um, you have to go to this special place where you sit and, um, and you get uh, talked to and, and the assistant principal comes and, and wants to talk with you personally and then you sit in the group and then you spend some time there and then if you have some homework, you do your homework. And so I spent my first time, the whole time in Venice school, I been, went to detention. And so, um, and the other thing is I was in the marching band and so we had to practice after school. And so because of that, I had to get permission to go late to detention. And so they told me, they said, well, since you came late, you can stay even later. Okay. Well, just pinned down and being there, it really was a miserable experience. And guess what it taught me? I don't like detention. I don't. I really don't like it. And so, so in this case, the Lord says, I've got a special group for you to be in, the shepherd's detention hall. And you're going to go there, and it's not going to be pleasant. In fact, it's going to be worse than, than something like that. So here it is. God says, look, folks, you and I can get mad at this person over here or this person over there. And there are always some famous religious leader. They've got a, a book or a product or something, and, and they're a false teacher. They're actually dishonestly a false teacher. But the Lord is going to take care of them. They will stand before him at judgment day. And where someone that claims to speak for God and lies, there's a, there is a special judgment for them. And so the Lord says, I've got some shepherding that I'm going to do for you because of your evil deeds. But this is not somebody that's having a bad day or misspoke or whatever. All right, it goes on, uh, verse 3, then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. Now in this case, this is an interesting thing, I myself. This is um, a kind of a special, a special thing here in uh, grammar. We use it in English, um, that where you kind of use those two pronoun pronouns back to back. But it's kind of, it's really for emphasis. I myself am going to do it. It's like if you talk to me and said, well, hey, Mike, could you, um, could you see that this gets done? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take care of that. Now, really, can you really see that it gets done? I myself will do it. What, that's called marriage, right? Okay, so, so the idea there is that God, in a sense, is saying, I give you a promise by the highest authority there is, myself, 
that I'm going to do it. So this is a promise of God where God says, you may be discouraged. You may feel defeated. Uh, You may feel like, why should I serve God? If all these other people are not serving God, God says, I'm going to tell you something. I myself promise you that I will make it right. Now, a judgment passage like this is meant to not just punish the wicked, but encourage the faithful. You see, the Lord knows that you and I, we can get discouraged. If, if our leadership, if our leadership uh, uh, doesn't lead in the right way, if we fail in leadership, then we, we discourage the membership. And so Sarah, in this case, though, he says, you know, as, a, as an individual believer, I have to keep my eyes on Jesus. Uh, my spiritual temperature is not measured compared to your spiritual temperature. In other words, if you're cold for the Lord, I don't have to cool down. I can be a thermostat and not a thermometer. And And so I want to stay hot for Jesus. I want to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to serve him. Say, well, this person hurt me or they let me down or whatever. It's okay. Well, guess what? Jesus is always faithful. He never let me down. So as long as he's faithful, I'm following him him, not any human being. I'm going to let you down. You're going to let me down. It doesn't matter. Jesus will never let us down. And that's what we have to keep our eyes on. You know, we can always point at the faults of each other and say, well, you should have done this or you could have done that. Very true. But I'm telling you, we really should be looking to Jesus and keep our eyes on him. All right. So the Lord says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock. So the shepherds scattered the sheep. The children of Israel are going into captivity. God says, guess what? I'm going to bring them back. Now, this is one of those promises that's a pretty bold promise. Because what in the world is going on? Well, the background, it's not all found here in chapter 23, but the background is this. The Assyrian Empire had come down in in about 786 B.C., and they had wiped out the ten tribes of the northern part of Israel. A few scattered remnants had gone south to what was called Judah, the kingdom of Judah, but they're really kind of wiped off the map. The Assyrians come and conquer them, and then in 586 B.C., the the, um, the Babylonian Empire comes in and they capture and take away as a group the people in the southern part of the country. So you have the the northern part of the country in the 700s, the southern part, 586 B.C. The land of Israel is wiped out. The people are are scattered among the Assyrian Empire. Some had fled to the Egyptian Empire and some are now in the Babylonian Empire. And so you've got the the three world empires that are all kind of uh, imprisoning the Jewish people. And the Lord says, don't worry, I'll get everybody back. Now, wait a minute. Are you telling me that God can, can, is bigger than the Babylonian Empire? I mean, at the time, uh, they're undefeated. They are the, the dominant empire. When battles come, Assyria is kind of having some problems, but, but God can, can defeat Babylon. Can God defeat Babylon? Absolutely. He can bring his people back from Babylon. But wait a minute. Well, the Assyrians, now they've had better days, okay? Uh, maybe they have a few more losses than wins at this time, but they're still called the Nazi Germany of their day. They're brutal just to be brutal. They're cruel just to be cruel. When they take you prisoner, they take giant fish hooks and hook you through the mouth and tie you together so nobody escapes. Uh, They take prisoners of war and put them on the ground and drive their chariots over them, breaking the bones in your your arms and legs so that you'll lie there and die a slow and painful death. That's the Assyrians. The Assyrians are one that every time they conquer a territory, they take the statues of their gods and they take them to their big temple there in uh, the capital of Assyria, Nineveh, and they lay them on the ground as if the, the statue is bowing to their god, Nisroch. And so that's the Assyrians. And so, so the Assyrians, God can, God can defeat the Assyrians? Yes, he can. Well, wait a minute. What about the Egyptians? I mean, they're not only an old empire, but they've got all these magical arts and mystic ways and spiritual powers and all these dark dark, evil things going on there. Can God defeat the evil, mystical, magical power of Egypt? Yes, he can. God says, look, when it's my will, the world's circumstances don't matter. You see, we let circumstances decide our decision-making. Oh, this is too hard. This is not going to be easy, or, or this is too big a hill to climb, or whatever. And I'm telling you, God says, I'll, I'll bring them back. Even though these wicked shepherds, they, they scattered my people, I'm going to bring them back. I myself will do it. What God is saying here is, I'm more powerful than any government in the world. I'm more powerful than any empire in the world. And that applies to today. 
We can look around the world and we can name a lot of places where wickedness is going on. <clears throat> whether it's a, a well-known country or whether it's an unknown country. We can name places where, where there is oppression going on. We can name places where slavery is being practiced even today. We can name all those places, but is God bigger than that? Yes, he is. And so God is promising his people, I will bring you back. All right, he goes on, verse 3, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. Verse 4, I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. I don't, I don't know if Dr. Howard Bickers, who was a missions professor at Mid-America, if he ever preached at, at Ridgeway many years ago, he's in heaven now, but he used to talk about just uh, all the things that go on and how there's spiritual battles and in churches and ministries and on the mission field and things like that. And, you know, somebody will come along and they want to stop the work of God or thwart the will of God. And he said, one thing I've learned through the years, though, is whenever somebody's working for the devil, when the devil's done with them, he always throws his tools away. He said, so if you're in the devil's employment, you better get out because there's no retirement plan. He doesn't let you just kind of finish your evil work peacefully. What happens is you're done. He's done with you. You're done. He said, better to stay faithful to the Lord. Don't be a worker for the devil. So, so the Lord says, guess what? If the current religious leaders fail, I'll raise up new ones. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. One of our uh, Mid-America students is uh, named Ixan Lesmanto, and um, he's from the country of Indonesia. And in Indonesia, they've had a lot of persecution where Muslims will, will come in and try to, um, to stop Christianity from spreading. And one of the strategies is they'll go into a village and they'll kill the pastor of the church there. Because their thought is if we kill the pastor, the church will go away. And they say, if anybody else wants to be the pastor we'll come back and kill them too. So we, we talked to him, what happens? He said, somebody else says, God has called me to be the pastor. Let's gather next Sunday, we'll continue worshiping. Knowing that at some point, a group of people have promised, whether they will or not, that didn't always happen, but they promised if we come back through here, we're gonna kill you next. Would you want to be a pastor under those conditions? Uh, there's no escape. The government is not going to come in and intervene. It's just you and your trust in the Lord. You know, we have it so good here in the United States of America. We should really be thankful for our country. We should pray for revival of our nation, not just that our nation would be revived, but so that we can continue to send missionaries out all over the world. But I'm telling you here, God says, you know what? I'll raise up more shepherds. One of the early pastors in Christianity in history, Tertullian, he died about 260 A.D. And he had a famous saying that, that is, uh, he considered to be true, but a lot of people don't like it. He said, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. He said, when people are willing to say, I'll, I'll live for Jesus, and if necessary, I'll die for Jesus, people see that's the real faith that this world is craving. So God will raise up believers. He will raise up pastors. He will raise up the right kind of shepherds. We keep our eyes on the Lord. If I let you down or somebody else lets you down, you keep your eyes on Jesus. So verse 4, I will raise up shepherds over them. They will tend them. They will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. And then finally, we have this wonderful promise about Jesus. Verse 5, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Some translations say sprout, but this is all connected to that idea of the root of David. Now, why does David get brought up? David is long dead by this time. Uh, why do we care about what's going on in the life of David? Well, God had promised David, one of your descendants will be a king. He'll not just be a king, he'll be a king that will reign forever, and he'll be a king that is a good king, and he will be a king that is a good shepherd, and he will be a king who is God. That's the promise that David had been given, and so here this promise comes in Jeremiah. There's going to be raised up a righteous branch from the line of David, and goes on, and he will reign as king and act wisely. Now, what in the world does it mean wisely? You and I could say that biblically. In other words, he's going to follow the truth of God. That's what we want. We want someone to be biblical. 
You know, if you went to the doctor and the doctor had some bad news for you, but he didn't want to hurt your feelings, and there was actually a cure, there was a medicine that would cure your problem, but, but he didn't want to hurt your feelings, so he never told you about it, and then the problem got worse, and later you told the doctor, doctor, why didn't you solve this problem? Why didn't you tell me? He said, I was afraid you'd be offended if I told you. I mean, you had to take these pills for two weeks, and, and um, if you do that, I mean, it would have been cured, but I didn't, want to, I didn't want you to be mad at me. You'd be mad now, wouldn't you? Just tell me the truth. Just tell me the truth. I mean, my personal doctor, Dr. Dr. Rubin, I I asked him one time, I said, doctor, you know, you've complained about my weight for years. Um, What are we going to do about it? He said, I'm sending you to a specialist. And I said, really, what kind of specialist? He said, a large animal veterinarian. And so uh, anyway, so, and it's really worked. It's really helped a lot. All right. So, so here it is. He's going to, to send a king. This king is going to reign forever. And God's going to do what? Tell the truth. <laughs> He's going to go on, verse 5, and do justice and righteousness in the land. Justice is really the, the way we treat each other. Being just is not making you happy or saying things you want to hear. It's being biblical with you. So if I'm just with my neighbor and they're lost, I don't tell them anything except I love you in the name of Jesus. I want you to know Jesus as your Savior. That's that's being just. If someone is a brother or sister in Christ, a fellow church member, they're in sin, the just thing to do is say, hey, this is not, this is not good. You shouldn't do this. You know, it's it's going to be bad for you. You should you should stop that or or start doing this. And so here it is. He says he will rule with justice and righteousness. He will personally be righteous and he will expect us to be righteous as well. Verse 6, in his days, Judah will be saved. Now, what a wonderful Old Testament word, saved. Now, here the word saved can mean rescued. It'd be like if somebody falls in the water, you pull them out, they're saved. But, but really, the idea is redeemed. So, so this is going to be a king who's going to be wise righteous and a redeemer all right now not only that Israel will dwell securely so this is going to be a king that has a home for us a place to live well that starts to sound a little more like a New Testament sermon it goes on and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness the Lord our righteousness Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, verse 7 says, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought you up, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I'd driven them, then they will live on their own soil. So what's happening here? God says, look, follow me, and I'm going to send you a king who will not only be in authority, but this king will be just. This king will be righteous. This king will reign forever. This king will be a king that fulfills prophecy, the foretelling. This will be a king who not only can do all these things for you, but he'll have a home for you to live forever back in this place where God has promised you. And you know, that just reminds us of John chapter 14 when the Lord Jesus, who's the fulfillment of this prophecy, says, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, here's why we keep our eyes on Jesus, because he's not only the light, but he's the path. I want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I want to live my life according to the teachings of Jesus, because I'm going to the place of Jesus, heaven. You see, Jesus said, I've got a place for you, and it's heaven. You keep living for me, you keep looking to me, you keep following me, you keep learning from me, and as you go along in life and you have the ups and downs of life that we all experience, have you had the disappointments of life that we're all going to have, have you had the high points of life that we hope to have from time to time, you just keep your eyes on me, follow the path, and I'm here in this place prepared for you where you will dwell securely forever and it's called heaven and you get there by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ would you bow your heads this morning every head bowed and every eye closed I want to talk to us for just a moment as we begin our our time of decision our invitation Ridgeway Baptist Church loves Jesus and they love you so much that they set aside a part of their morning worship time just to do business with the Lord Yes, it's wonderful to to be able to sing wonderful music, to listen to to glorious songs. It's a great thing to be able to read the Bible and talk about it. What a great thing that is. But you know what? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, that's a personal question. 
but it's a personal decision. See, I'm not asking, are you a church member or have you been through some religious ceremony or ritual? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? And it all starts by asking him, by calling to him and asking him to forgive you of your sins and by asking Jesus to take charge of your life. Romans 10, 13 is a Bible promise just for you. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So that following the Lord begins with trusting the Lord. It begins with putting your life in his hands. And then from that point on, you keep your eyes on Jesus. How can you do that? Well, it doesn't have to be on a Sunday or in a church building, but you could do it today if you need Jesus. If there's never been a time in your life when you trusted him for salvation, you're old enough to know that you are a sinner. You've displeased God. You know that you need Jesus. You could pray this prayer with me. This is a sinner's prayer, and I do this without apology because I want it to be crystal clear for you how you can be saved. Would you like to meet Jesus today? then you can just write where you are, the privacy of your heart and mind, pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, just pray with me. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. Forgive me of my sin. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead for me. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. Without looking up, did you pray that prayer today? If you did, Jesus heard you. Heaven rejoices, and Jesus wants you to tell somebody. He says in Matthew's gospel, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. The moment we'll be standing and singing and our pastors are here at the front. They love Jesus and they love you. And we want you to come. We're expecting you to come. That's what a decision time is. You can just come and they'll ask you why you've come. Say, I want to follow Jesus. And they'll tell you what those next steps are. Maybe you're already saved, but you need a church home. And why not come home to a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving church today? Why not come home? Maybe you just want to pray where you are or come and pray in the altar. Whatever it is that the Lord has spoken to you about today, just do whatever it takes to be right with him. Maybe you're harboring a grudge or a hurt against somebody that, that, um, that maybe had some spiritual authority that hurt you. Why not make a conscious decision today to forgive them and then tell the Lord you're sorry for taking your eyes off of him. You see, often our hurt at others is because we weren't watching the Lord there's something you need to make right today. Why not make that right? You do whatever the Lord leads you to do. Father, we are a needy people, but we say, help us, O Lord, because you are our mighty God. You are glorious, wonderful, and we give honor to the name of Jesus today. And we pray your blessings on this time of invitation. Call out the called and moved in our midst. We pray in Jesus' sweet name. Amen.